So where are we? We are in the famous George the Third Vineyard in Rutherford. It's a Bexhopper Vineyard. And who are you? I am Sarah Francis, yeah. winemaker. Winemaker. And you're a new winemaker. You started in September. Yeah, this is my first release. I'm just now releasing the 2010 vintage um, from this vineyard. And I also have a Chardonnay from Bexhopper Canaros Lake. So in the tech industry, we always uh, talk about overnight successes like, like Twitter and Pinterest, and they really took six years to happen. Yes. And so you're, you've been working in this vineyard for five years now? Almost, almost five, technically more like four. Yeah, okay. that would be more accurate. What, what makes this vineyard uh, important? Cause I, when I showed my, my bottle that I bought from you uh, to the Ritz Sommelier, he's like, how did she get uh, Beckstopper grapes? <laughs> So yes. what makes this such a, an important vineyard? Uh, it's very historic. So it's called one of the heritage vineyards of Napa Valley. So back when wine all started and our friends from overseas brought us all of their information and um, their knowledge, um, it is considered one of those beginning vineyards that helped establish Napa Valley as a premier um, grape growing region. And I'm sure you all are familiar with the Paris tasting competition and so there's vineyards like this that help put that on the map so George Latour he and George Latour family owned this vineyard it came on a grant from General Yant it was passed down through family so it came on a, like a Spanish land grant and then historically um, kept transferring hands ended up in a French family who um, is very famous in France and, uh, for winemaking and they had a Russian winemaker, they owned a, a BV Vineyards. Um, so this was actually the homestead of that family was back here and their daughter. Um, and they made wine out of these vineyards ever since, um, you know, probably became well known by the 70s, but even prior to that. And Andy came in with a company named Hubline, who was actually trying to compete with um, the Rossies and the Gallows of the world, which made mainly bulk wines out of uh, Central Coast and like Lodi, things like that, and they did spirits as well. So Hubline kind of came in trying to compete with that, and they actually couldn't because these vineyards were are more established for premium luxury wine brands, and it didn't make any sense to rip up all that good work and this good genetics and the soil. Um, acclimate it for something different that was lower priced just so you can get massive yields out of it. It didn't really make sense and Andy I think was a pioneer in seeing the potential of that because he kind of, um, um, I don't want to speak out of turn, but he, he kind of um, befriended people and was smart enough to um, humble himself and learn from them. And I think that um, that's the way he got some of the partnerships going and then he made a deal. Hubline said we don't want to really be in this business. And so they made a deal with him, and um, he was able to buy their interests in all these vineyards. Yeah. Um, and he started his own corporation. And with the whole, this was his vision. So what you're seeing today is was something he saw, you know, uh, 30, now, 40 years ago. You're not from Napa. No. You're not from a famous wine maker family or anything no, like that, right? No, I'm not from any other. Actually. Where are you from? <laughs> well, I was born in Dallas and raised in California, then um, Washington, Oregon, and then Michigan, and then my parents retired to Missouri. So I did have a great grandmother, and that's kind of where the, my love of grapevine started. We didn't have um, anybody in our family making wine, but my great grandmother had a little hobby section of her orchard and garden that she dedicated to growing grapevines. And I don't know if um, anybody watching has ever had an imaginary friend when they were little or has known anybody, but I did, and they were grapevines. And my parents told me that I would just come out to the section of my grandmother's garden and orchard and talk to this one section of grapevine. And I had them all named and I sang to them and I literally would go out there every morning and I would hang out there until the absolute sun went down and they forced me dragging and kicking to come back in the house. And um, that started when I was really, really little. Where did that come from? I don't know. You see, sometimes um, I liken it as it's just my natural affinity and my connection to creation and um, it's where I have peace and joy and happiness and I think instinctively I knew that as a child, that but, it was going to be my safe and happy place. But you fought it, didn't you? 
I, well, I do. I think anytime, well, girls, it's, it's hard to explain how we're taught in the world what we can be and what we can't be. It's a very, um, you know, we're taught to be at home and be nurturers and there's nothing wrong with that. But you and worked at Johnson & Johnson? Right? I did. I started actually my career in healthcare and I worked for Johnson Johnson, which is uh, one of the world's largest healthcare corporations. And I worked for them all over the United States doing pharmaceuticals and um, biotechnology sales because I had two children and I was single mom and that's what you needed to do to, you know, make a living. And um, I thought that was the responsible thing to do. But I always, the whole entire time, was tinkering with grapevines um, and eventually making wine in my basement, in my garage, and anything I could get my hands on trying to get this uh, intense need, this compulsion to explore growing vines and making wine out of my system. I almost thought if I got it out, it would stop perplexing me, it would stop driving me insane, but it only got worse. And it's like an addiction, and once you're in it, if, I would rather die than somebody take me away from this. Just would rather die. And that's the entrepreneurial thing that, that, you know, Rocky and I thought about starting companies, and we just don't have that. We don't have that compulsion to <laughs> <laughs> jump off, you know, uh, uh, you know, a ledge without a parachute, try to build a parachute on the way down. <laughs> you know? Well, I think that actually if you have, there's something in everybody that is your sense of joy, whatever that is. So my dad gave me this quote, and I don't recall who actually said this, but it says, don't ask what the world needs. Instead, find what makes you come alive and go do that. Because the, what the world really needs is more people that have come alive. So in every one of us, we have this inner knowledge of what it is that makes us feel at home and at ease. And for some people, it's a variety of things. My daughter, she can do, she has many talents. She can draw, she can sew, she can do fashion, she can do design, she can do computers. So she could go into a lot of, she's very blessed in that regard that she can find multiple streams of joy. But everybody has at least one gift or talent that if they've just really explored, it's fear that holds you back. Yeah. It's fear that says, no, a girl can't make wine. You can't be in agriculture. You're never going to make any money at that. You don't have an education at that. What will people think? It's all those things that really hold us back but which, it's there which gets us to why you bought what why you were able to buy wine from this vineyard because everybody told you, you nobody unknown could buy wine at this vineyard right Beckstoffer you know the Ritz recognized it right yes. they were like how did she get grapes from Beckstoffer <laughs> well, <laughs> it was actually a funny I'm story. not a wine I'm not a wine no, expert so I have no idea what what the meaning of this vineyard is but I, and I, I didn't initially know what the meaning of the Beckstoffer name was or why it was so difficult but um, so I basically made the decision through some mentors who said Sarah you've been doing this and you're doing well at home but you need to go for it leap and go to Napa Valley and make wine and I was like oh I can't do that you know I don't have any education I don't have a winery I don't have 20 million dollars I don't I'll just you know make do here and they were like we refuse to let that happen to you you are the kind of person that this has been going on and it's been easy for where you. was this where Missouri was... actually so, so you're really... making wine in Missouri mm -hmm. as an assistant just part-time and um, to learn really and he encouraged me, he said, you're good at this, you need to go for it. If you were my daughter, I would tell you this. And he said, I want somebody to tell my daughter this. He said, go for it. So I thought about it, and then I said, all right. So I resigned my job and decided I was moving to California. I called a real estate agent, I sold everything I had, and moved to Napa Valley, not knowing anybody or what I was going to do. or how. I to it was a complete leap of faith. Um, and there was always this gut thing in me that said, yes. But there's a lot of grapes in Napa Valley. Is, Why right. this vineyard? Well, I did a lot of research and um, tasted a lot of fantastic wines, and I always kind of knew what my favorites, and they all have this name on the bottle. And so I sought out the owner of this vineyard, Andy Beckstoffer, and people said, oh, he's never going to talk to you. 
And I go, what do you mean he's not going to talk to me? <laughs> well, first of all, you're not proven. Second of all, you can't afford his grapes. He doesn't need to sell them to you. He doesn't work with unknown people. It was just this whole litany of things of how it was never going to happen and I should not waste my time. And why would I even want to break into the winemaking world at such a high level um, of winemaking without any experience? It was too risky. So it, it completely, everybody was saying it's a bad business decision. It's a bad financial decision. It's a bad marketing decision. Everything that was bad, bad, bad. But I had a gut instinct that told me when I drank those wines I had to have this vineyard and so I, I called him up I got his number and I called him up and he was out of the country at the time and I basically said listen people tell me that uh, you won't sell any grapes to me and I can't afford them and they're telling me all these things but where I come from we tell that to people's faces so you can tell me now but do it to my face give me the courtesy and the decency to call me back sir and a couple of weeks passed i didn't hear anything so i thought oh well maybe they were right you know and uh, but he did he called and he actually said uh where the hell is 573 area code because he's from virginia he has this really gentlemanly southern accent and i said missouri and he said well i'll be damned i have a vineyard named missouri hopper what do you need little girl and we just had this long conversation that covered everything from the Olympics to grape growing. And at the end of that conversation, he said, I like the way you talk. I said, well, I like the way you talk too, sir. He goes, I'm intrigued. I don't normally do this, but I'll give you a meeting. Bring me one of them Olympic pins that your company has. My company has sponsored the Olympics and my son was kind of trying to swim for the Paralympic team we were going to try out, which is one of the, where was a conflict in us meeting and that's how that conversation came about. So. Um, I flew out here and I met him. We drove past Tokolon uh, earlier today and um, yeah, I met him there. Vineyard down the street. Yeah, and I, I walked that vineyard with him for a couple hours. He asked me every kind of winemaking knowledge, vin viticulture knowledge question that you could to see if I knew what I was doing. Like what did he doing. ask? If you he know, was here right now, what would he? Oh, you, uh, you know, he would be like, "What, you know, what do you think about this cane spacing? What do you think about the pruning? What do you think about the canopy? What do you think about the soil?" And we just had this whole litany of dialogue that went along. And then he said, "You're pretty interesting." And he said, "Why do you want to make wine?" And I said, "Well, quite frankly, because my soul refuses to let me do anything else and be happy. And so I have to. There's no question about this." have to do this and there's only one wine that I've ever fallen in love with and it's wines that came from your vineyard and I have that in my brain and that's the wine I'm gonna make and he said well I never met anybody like you that's for sure and yeah. I'm, I've never seen anybody with the kind of passion that you have the intensity that you have and the commitment that you have and um, he said then well what do you want to do how much wine do you want to make I said, well, how much are the grapes? And he goes, well, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. And I was like, oh, well, I got my checkbook and I showed him how much money I had. And he goes, that's not enough. <laughs> and, I, and he started talking to me about white wines. He said, I want to make a Chardonnay. And I, I literally started crying because I was so angry at this point. And I said, quite frankly, sir, don't insult me and try to convince me to do something else in wine. I came to you because I want to make Cabernet Sauvignon. I don't want to make California Chardonnay. I hate California Chardonnay. Although you make a damn good um, one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so he said, well, what kind of white wines do you like? I said, I like Burgundian French style Chardonnays. And you can't do that in California. And he looked at me and he said, get in the truck. And I was like, I thought he was kicking me out of the vineyard. And uh, he drove me over to Canaros. He said, this is a really special place. And he talked about acidities and pH and all the things that make people like me as winemakers completely geek out. And I started walking skeptical because I was like, whatever, it's not happening here in California. I've tasted a lot of California Chardonnay and I'm yeah. just not interested. And um, he, he started you know, talking about this vineyard and he's so passionate about it. And he said, I think you could make your style of Chardonnay that you like to drink, but do it, it's me completely California and, and let people see the full breadth of what California Chardonnay can be. It, you can have great acidity here. You can have beautiful aromatics. You can do lots of things here. You don't have to make this big, huge Chardonnay. Um, and it can still be approachable even at a young age. Trust me. And he said, I'll tell you what, if you'll make a barrel of Chardonnay and a barrel of Cabernet, we'll help get you started that way. And I don't ever do this. 
This is you. I don't do this. Everything you heard was right, but there's something about you that reminds me of when I started. And somebody took me under their wings, and I was willing to learn, and I have this feeling that you're willing to learn. And we get you in front of some mentors, and I'd really like to see how you progress, because I'm convinced that if anybody can make it and be um, successful in the wine business, it is you. Yeah. And I just cried, and he, that's when he brought me here, and he said, this is the venue that I think you should start in for your Cabernet Sauvignon and expand from, from this vineyard. And um, when we stepped on this ground, I was, my, I was smitten and my, I just melted. And so between Carneros and Chardonnay, which did turn out very um, you know, high in acids and beautiful aromatics and a, a really crisp profile that's very minerally and very um, site specific. And that's really what I love about, well, this is my love. These are my friends and they've been my friends since I was little. So to be near them and see them express themselves in wine is like, it's everything I thought it would be. Tell me a little bit about the wines that, like you have three rows, right? Three rows here. Uh -huh, in like how long are they all the way to? Uh, they're 50 fines long. So you get about um, right around one ton, sometimes less out of here. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, so this kind of, I got my high heels on. Yep. Excuse me. So we have all this, um, uh, volcanic ash and this is a very gravelly soil it drains really well so the vines tap deep and then they struggle for all their nutrients and then they express themselves in this very powerful cabernet that's yet beautiful and an elegant and gentlemanly way to present itself it's never rude it's never obnoxious but you have no doubt that this wine is going to um, bring everything it's got these vines do they're just a very powerful place and it's um I think it's just because of that pedigree of history yeah. that that's why they're expressing themselves this way. And the terroir here is just really, really special. It's just so well suited for Cabernet. So uh, the Russian winemaker, he first coined the phrase of um, Rutherford dust. And so that's what you're standing on, is Rutherford dust. Mm -hmm. It's a very um, terroir-driven, site-specific. Terroir vineyard. means the earth. The earth, yeah. yeah. I hear so, when you get into wine, pe people start using all these weird terms, and, and that's yeah. why it's sort of unapproachable for a lot of people. Right? I know, it can be very intimidating, but um, like I said, it's something about wine is a zen sport, and as long as you find wines that can make you um, slow down and lose yourself in the moment, you can then begin to appreciate what the differences are amongst wine, and it really is just you communicating with the wine through appreciation. That's all I ask anybody to do take time with what's in your glass to appreciate what it's telling you. Don't worry about if you if it's wrong or if it's right or just what is it telling you? What is its story? And you'll begin to see the nuances. For instance, you can tell the difference between um, the taste of clusters on the sunny side versus the shady side. Um, one row can make a huge difference because it may drain differently. The sunlight may be different. Um, all these things, the canopy may be managed different from row to row depending on the winemaker and their uh, specific, specific philosophy on how much sunlight they want there. You're literally walking distance to Camus, which is one of my other favorite wines. Yeah. Right? And they, they consistently have great wine. Right, and all these vines that you see after my three rows, those all belong to Schrader. Um, Thomas Rivers Brown is their winemaker and he's been winemaker of the year before and he is the first winemaker is the first wine to ever get perfect 100 scores from every critic on the planet basically so all the same right next, right next to your right next to your right. grape is right. that kind of high bar yeah yes exactly so i put a lot of feet to ground here and um does this passion and um to exceed that bar to exceed that bar i be, try to become as intimate as i can with these vines and watch them and monitor them i taste every single cluster I do a lot of crazy things in wine that other people don't do, and I think that's why people are drawn to my wine. Yeah. Somebody asked me on, on Facebook, what, because I keep talking about, you, as a startup, you have to have a great story. Mm -hmm. And people are like, what are you talking about? And what, what do you mean by story? And I, I think you, you're the embodiment of that, but to have a great story, you have to know what you're talking about. Right. You have to have something to back it up with, right? You can't just... And to me, that's, be risky. to me, that's the database. And mm -hmm. you, you spent, tell me how much time you spend here and how much time the other great winemakers 
spend in their in their vineyards here? Uh, so I spend pretty much a portion of every day here. Um, for the main reason is it's my happy place and it's where I get centered and calm. And the other reason is um, I'm, I still have this compulsion to perfect what I did the vintage before. So I'm, I take notes, I'm logging every little thing that I do. What happens if, um, based on how much leaf foliage do you have? What if you remove the basil leaves? What if you open up things at certain times before fruit set? All these different things. What if you don't use water? What, what can happen? And I'm constantly monitoring that data to see every little tweak, every little thing that happens, how does the vine respond? And in order to do that, you have to have feet to the ground. And because I would much rather me bring in this beautiful fruit that I just put into a barrel and ferment in the barrel and I don't touch it. I let it express itself. I don't want to try to fix. Some people, they're, they're more passionate about what happens in the winery and less passion. They let somebody else handle the vineyard and there's nothing wrong with either style of winemaking, but this is my love. And so it's natural for me to want this to be as perfect as possible before it ever hits the door. I don't want to try to fix anything when it gets there. Um, and all of the all the mentors that um, I have, like the people like Aaron Pott and Todd Anderson, those are the people that spend a tremendous amount of time connected to the earth that they farm. And really, we all feel like we're part farmer, part winemaker. Yeah. Um, and we root ourselves around that community of people that will do anything to protect this. Mm. And everything we do is about love for this. And then we bring it to life by um, basically guarding it until it's ready to be exposed to the world. It's interesting how uh, Napa talks and, and the product that you're making is similar in a lot of ways to software, to the product that most of my customers and, and people I hang out with, they instrument their apps so that they know everything about what's going on, right? So that yeah. they know how people are reacting to it. Knowledge and, is power and I think the more you integrate and the more you communicate um, and the more transparent you are with whatever you're doing the more trust you have, and I think nature responds to that level of trust too. It doesn't matter if it's people, it's nature, and I try to do on both sides. I try, I'm probably the most transparent winemaker that most people have seen. I pretty much publish everything that I do. Um, I can't help it. I'm, maybe I have Tourette's, I'm not sure. Whatever just <laughs> comes across my head just gets spit out of my mouth to the world to hear. Um, but, well, you're you're a, a, an oversharer on Facebook, which I, I know. really like. I <laughs> know. I'm very much an oversharer. I actually get criticized a lot for that because, um, you know, sometimes in Napa Valley and any place, we try to act like we ride in on unicorns and everything is perfect, and it's not. It's farming, and it changes. And this is a live plant, and I I don't have control over it. It's going to do what it wants to do based on what's going on in this environment and how it wants to respond in its pedigree and the earth and the soil and all these variables I don't have any control over for us to constantly yeah, pretend could, that oh every vintage is perfect <laughs> a, a bug could come in here and wipe out your vineyard, absolutely yeah. absolutely or you can get mold you can get frost you can get too much rain you can get not enough sunlight you can have a virus all kinds of things happen but very rarely will you hear about that kind of stuff in the public domain yeah. And I don't know, so I get criticized a lot, but occasionally I go, well, my unicorn broke down on the way to work, <laughs> or my unicorns are on strike this week, <laughs> and they're not cooperating. You know, so I'm very transparent. What, what do you wish people knew about wine? Cause, you know, it, it, it took me uh, a long time to get to you, right? Because I had to go and drink a lot of wine. I, I had to <laughs> hang out with Gary Vaynerchuk, and he, he took me to Sonoma and taught me a little bit about wine. And I had to come up here, I don't know, 40 times or something like that before I got to the place where I, I met you. Most most tourists can't meet a winemaker here. Right, exactly. Africa. You get to the, go to the tasting room, which is right over right. there, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and you get to meet and some marketing front, guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's rare to meet a winemaker, but I try to be very hands-on. Um, I keep myself very small so that I can do that. Yeah. Um, it's very important to me. But I think if you're... People shouldn't be intimidated or scared by wine. Um, I, I guess the best way for me to describe it is just to put it on a personal level. There are a lot of people that are actually, um, they refer to me as um, intimidated or they make a blanket statement about me. I don't know if it's because I'm blonde or... I get a lot of people that just, you know, sub uh, judgment. Yeah, I Does saw that it in sense? my comments like, on Facebook. <laughs> of, yes, this is her. Yes, you saw some of the, the you know, the 
backlash. They can, I don't do anything. I think that that happens in wine too. People get intimidated, they get frightened, they get scared, and they have this standoffish attitude or they go, well, I don't drink luxury wines, it's out of my budget. Or I don't drink box wines, that's beneath me. It's wine and it's all beautiful. And it was made by beautiful people and you should get to know it. That's all, just get to know it. And once people get to know me, I'm not scary. I'm a very fun, down to earth person. And I'm not, I'm very intelligent and I'm very passionate and I'm all the things you would expect out of a wonderful person. But if people just judge one thing and whatever, you know, skew of vein they're perceiving things through. Um, Where you know. I was going is, you know, when you go to a Safeway or a grocery store and you see 200 kinds of wine there, it's, uh, a little bit daunting. All you have to go on is your is the label and a little bit of your knowledge. And most people, let's be honest, don't have that much knowledge about you know thirty or forty different kinds of wine. Most, sure. Most people haven't had that kind of experience, right? I say that it's like learning anything. You immerse yourself in it, and you just take risks, right? Yeah. So you start off with whatever wine you feel is interesting. You're not going to go wrong. You taste it. And that's what you do. You My dad wine. drank a lot of Gallo jug wine. <laughs> I have too. <laughs> he has a lot of vineyards around here, I yeah. noticed. <laughs> yes, he does. I have, uh, I have too, and there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. You know, um, and Gina Gallo is now a descendant, and she's making excellent wines herself, and they own Raymond Vineyards, which is not too far from here, and um, doing excellence in wine in yeah. a variety of places in California. So. I just say get to know wine, period. What I did is I, I started just drinking whatever I could get my hands on yeah. and trying it. And then that's how I developed my palate. Then one day you're going to come across a wine and it's going to literally stop you in your tracks. And you'll be driven by that taste and haunted by it for a long, long time. And that's when you know you've come upon something special. It's just like finding a really special person. Some people are all great and you enjoy meeting them, but there's sometimes these very special people that come into our lives and they change our lives forever. Right. Wine is the same way. And it's, these are my friends. That's why I keep bringing it back to friendship. No, that's why we brought to you know out people. here. Yes. I didn't want to do this interview in a, in a wine cave or somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you know, these yeah. are your friends. I wanted to meet them. <laughs> these are very much my friends. Yeah, they're asleep right now, but yes. Um, and. Um, it's just like any good relationship you start experimenting with that and you develop a palate and you begin to through wine you begin to know yourself yeah in the tech it's industry the wonderful thing about it in the tech industry i noticed there's a season right south yeah. by southwest is coming up and i noticed a lot of entrepreneurs are working their butts off right now in fact my, my friend andy couldn't come because he has to launch his product oh. you know? <laughs> And that's what it takes to be an entrepreneur, right? Uh, discipline. <laughs> I hate that word. <laughs> yeah. I hate discipline. <laughs> well, but it's it wisdom, takes... right? Um, yeah, wisdom's different. Discipline is another thing altogether. <laughs> well, it's wise to be disciplined, I guess, is what I was trying to say. Um, just why I, there have been times where I've army man crawled out of this vineyard because I couldn't stand up anymore physically. Tell me about You've that. You've seen yeah. an army man crawl. <laughs> I, I used to have army men in my I sandbox when I was a kid. I literally could not. I'd be down that end and I needed to get to my truck here There's and I couldn't Rocky. get out. And so I would just literally have to crawl because I couldn't stand up. That's discipline. It says yeah. that I have to be there because something's going on there and I need to learn about it and know about it and understand and let it communicate, sink into me, and then try to discover what I can do to help the fruit express itself in the best possible way. And you can't do that if you're not disciplined enough to be, be here. You can say all you want, you want a perfect body, and you want all this, but if you don't eat right, and you don't take care of it as your temple, well, that's probably not gonna happen unless you just have a complete, you know, luck, luck of, a stroke of luck. But there are things that when you do them and they're, you're more naturally inclined to them, that come easier. And I think that's another sign that you're in your vein, but everything is work, but it doesn't seem like work because if you're an entrepreneur and you're doing what you love and where your joy comes from, and you're surrounding yourself with people that are elevating you and challenging you and bringing you up further, then you're going to find that um, you get an energy from it where you don't get exhausted like other people. You're going to get tired, but it doesn't wipe you out like a normal job would. And it actually makes your brain work faster and harder and you'll come up with a hundred million more ideas. So I told my kids, I said, I used to tell them, but you know, they, my son wanted to be a chef or a comedian. And I said, well, you can be the funniest cooking neurosurgeon there ever was. You know, that's kind of what I told them. 
But then when I decided to pursue my own passion, I said, well, wait a minute. Let me just take that back. You go and do, you, sh you become a chef. You commit yourself to excellence in the culinary world. You find the one thing about it that just makes you sing. And you will become a master and an expert and people will seek you out for that advice. And you'll be entrepreneurial. You'll have more energy. You'll work harder at it than the average person. And you will find a way to make money at it. That is the beauty of true being a true entrepreneur that has found their niche. And when you do that, it all comes into place. But it can take a while. I have slept on the floor um, three different times in my life for an entire year. The first year I came here, I slept on the floor. So you didn't start from money? You didn't... No, no, <laughs> no. I, that's that's the famous uh, story in Napa. Oh, well, I wish you can yeah. you can make a nice. uh, you can make a nice fortune by starting out with a big one. In yeah, Napa. that's yeah. <laughs> start out with a billionaire, you become a millionaire in the wine industry. Yeah, that's for sure. No, but really, um, it's about um, I just I said I'm going to do it, yeah. and I'm going to put everything I have. I don't want to look back and go, well, maybe if I would have done that, I would have had a different outcome. I wanted to leave nothing. And I wanted to spend my entire self and leave it on the battlefield and say I was either a success or a failure because I did everything I knew. Tell me about the, tell me about the seasons that are that happen here. Because right now we're in early winter and the vines, like you said, are asleep or falling asleep. <laughs> right, they're in dormancy, which means they've shut down. Um, and then after this, they'll um, acclimate soils. They'll till up. Um, they'll come in and prune all these um, canes. Um, and they'll select uh, which ones we're keeping or which ones we want to grow new buds and flower from. Um, and then starting in the springtime, we'll have um, what we call um, flowering and budding and all these different, there, there's a lot of technical terms that I don't want to bore you with, but um, it's just like any plant. It goes into dormancy and then it comes out in spring and rebirths itself into life. And then it has this long growing season. Um, and the clusters start out with flowers. They look like a little flower bud. Um, and then from there, um, leaves and everything starts growing. And then you'll see these little tiny berries form that are just really microscopic. And then they get um, encapsulated. And that's what turns into a, a bigger berry. And then a whole cluster forms after that. So it's a rather long process. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, tell me and about... And it culminates in... Uh, for my rose and this vineyard, usually towards the latter part of October. This was a tip. This last vintage uh, 13 was a little bit earlier, but still, this vineyard here, uh, this block, this section takes a while to mature, which is actually a beautiful gift. Um, in that things don't go too fast or too slow. It takes its time and it gets this really good maturation. Um, I, it's a very well balanced wine as a result of that. And so I, even though the rest of the valley was maybe harvesting the first part of October to the, at the latest, the second week of October, we were into the third week. And normally I'm in the fourth week. So it was one week earlier for me. Um, so a little bit earlier, but for the rest of the valley was way early. How do you know when to pick the berries? I, you know, we've been tasting some of the grapes that have been left, left, behind, left on, yeah. on the vines, but. Um, which well, are really sweet now, right? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. Really, yeah. really sh high sugar. Right. When they, when they well, eat. that's because um, after about 26, 27 bricks, which is a measure of sugar, um, it determines what the alcohol content is going to be. Uh, the vine doesn't really produce any more bricks beyond that. What you get is an elevation in bricks due to dehydration because the vine starts shutting down and the berries left on there just start to almost raise in. And you see, you can get increased bricks beyond that, but it's not because of anything that the vine itself is doing to make that happen. Got it. Um, um, and then beyond that, um, you like I taste every cluster that goes in my wine. There's not a single cluster I don't taste. And what which is the advantage of being a, a small, a small what, what did somebody call you? Couture. A couture winer, <laughs> winemaker. You make three. Your first batch. It's very was, bespoke, yes, I guess. Very right, because you had 300 bottles, right? So yeah. you're not a Gallo or a Mondavi or, no, or one of those. No, no, those are um, hundreds different. of thousands or yeah. millions of cases. Yeah, I, I'm not there, and I never will be there. But they have um, a very unique and special place in, in the winemaking world, and that's what most of American tables drink. And um, I adore that because they're helping people get started in the love of wine. Yeah, yeah your wine's 150 for a cab, and I think it should be more. 
Well, uh, oh, so you heard it here. We're going to raise our prices. <laughs> well, I, I, I have drank some $300 bottles of wine that aren't as good, and I won't name them. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah. I have a feeling your prices are going to go up soon yeah. as you as you get known, right? Mm -hmm. This is a typical startup problem. It's a distribution problem. Yes, it's a problem. getting known. You're yes. a new person. You're a, a new winemaker. Even though you're in a famous vineyard and people are talking you up, it still takes time. Because the customers are not uh, the wine, other winemakers here in Napa, right? If I would give anyone advice, though, if I could translate something into the tech world, it would be to be transparent as much as you can in the social spectrum. Because it's all about relationships and building friendships and trust. And you can't do that if you don't have a dialogue with people, if you don't yeah. have interaction with them. Even if you feel like you don't know what to say or how to say it or you're going to say something wrong, people appreciate honesty and genuineness. And the more sincere you are about it, even if you say something silly or stupid. I mean, I rant on Facebook. I do a lot of probably things that people look down upon, but that's me. It's very genuine. You're not getting anything that's all Me too. I think, that, I think that's why I, tr I got attracted to you because I recognized you were a master storyteller, yeah. which most people uh, are not in, in that. But they tell the same damn story every yeah. time I come here. Yeah. Check out my you know, Well, because that's what one. works, right? It's like a formula. And I, I haven't chosen a formula at all. It was more about what does my gut and my passion say, what speaks yeah. to me, and then I just relay that to people, and I very much want to have a dialogue with them. So if I was a tech startup, I'd be doing the same thing. I'd be, I'd be trying to constantly interact with people about, well, what don't you like about that? Yeah. What makes you think that? Why do you need that? Well, if you, we did this, would you get any benefit of it? You know, and I would vent. I would be like, oh my God, so frustrating that I can't get this to work. And you know, get that dialogue and communication going and then tell my story about why I want to change this. Yeah. My tagline has always been on the cusp of turning the wine industry upside down. I don't do anything by the special unicorn logarithm that everybody <laughs> tries to recommend that you do. Um, but it's me, it's my story. In another vein, I, my boss just sent me a video of a football coach that never punts on fourth down. And he went. He he he's undefeated this season, right? Because he doesn't play the game everybody else is playing. He's come and up with his own strategy. So give me like three stories of how you're not playing the game everybody else in Napa is playing. Uh, well, first of all, I do things that are all about um, what I believe will result in a better wine, regardless of the expense. And I don't know if that's the best financial advice I could give anybody, but I do barrel ferments and 100% new oak. One of the great things that we did here was that we hand picked and harvested and then we brought the French barrels right in the rows and we distemmed the grapes directly from the harvested clusters directly into those barrels. And uh, nobody has ever done all of that in the world that I'm aware of. It's the first time it's ever been done. And so what does that mean? What, why does that work? What, or what, it what's works your because you're taking, um, you're not using machines which I feel have um, they're a little bit too violent for grapes and they produce um, chemical reactions that the, the plant responds to um, because of this violent force that's happening to it. When you're, and you have the human component, I believe that when you have passionate people loving and touching and invested in it, it shows in the quality of the wine. I, you know, it might sound a little hocus pocus, but that's my philosophy. But it does sound hocus pocus, but you actually tested it out, didn't I you? I did test it out. Which is the other lesson that we have in the software industry. Always do A-B testing, right? Right. Yeah. To, to prove that your theories aren't <laughs> all that hocus pocus, yeah. right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so what, what, I, happened, what happened when you did this A-B test between machine cutting and... Uh, I took, um, I had four new French barrels and I had, two of them were identical barrels. And I put handy stem fruit three quarters and then I did, uh, hi friend, I did one uh, quarter layer on the top of uh, machine to stem fruit. And then I had another barrel that was all 100% handy stemmed. And then the other two barrels were different makers. Um, so really the controls of identicalness would be these two barrels, except for one had some machine fruit in it and the other one had none. And the aromatics, the color, the structure, the mouthfeel, everything about this barrel um, that's all hand done by hand is just, I can't even explain. It has absolutely convinced me that the next vintage I have, no machine will touch it. I don't care if I have to sell everything I own again to hire enough people to help me hand do the fruit. Um, it just makes an amazingly more beautiful structured wine and everything about it just, it just cries, thank you. Thank you for letting us express ourselves. Thank you for letting us be who we are.
and there's just something it was a really magical moment for me as a winemaker and I brought in people to look other winemakers to look at the barrels and they were like holy cow you're right look at that it looks so much better than that one and it smells better and it tastes better now it's all going to homogenize and be blended together and clearly there's a lot of wines in Napa Valley and um, in France that um, use machines and they have beautiful 100 point scoring wines that sell for a lot of money and I've tasted them and they are they're exquisite so but I'm telling you, I can't wait for that vintage so that I can take that to the next level and truly say, I've done everything I know to facilitate this special place expressing itself in wine. And it is gonna be really magical. I, mean, I just got a glimpse of it this year to prove to myself that I was right. And uh, so there's no convincing me that. But so that what it, that means is a, a team of people doing that for 10 to 18 hours, a machine could run that fruit in 20 minutes.